Today we are in Birmingham, Alabama, and we are speaking with... You may call me Ahmad, Ahmed, or Ahmad, but officially it's Ahmad Farzad. But Ahmad Farzad is generally the easiest way to go about around here. All right. And if where I are may. you from? We know you, most people's going to think you're from the Middle East, but go <laughs> ahead and... Well, my blood, I'm, I'm Iranian. I am Middle Eastern by birth uh, or by blood, but I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. All right. And how did you get in this music business? I grew up mostly drawing, and it took me to Alabama School of Fine Arts for high school, which is an educational establishment in the city. And the same guy who was my best friend was also my mortal enemy because both of us were social outcasts and he lived in the dorms at ASFA and I was upstairs one day and he had his eyebrow shaved off because again we were weird and he had this $50 super cheap awful Japanese plastic guitar <laughs> but he put it on his leg and he played the opening chords to a song that was popular at the time and just hearing that it I was like, this is what I must be doing. That's when I was 15 and I'm 33 now. And since that one moment, my education, my passions, my hobbies, everything has been music. All right. From that day to the degree at Berkeley, how did we get from Birmingham to Berkeley? Well, I went to Tuscaloosa, University of Alabama, did advertising and marketing. I had a few friends pass away uh, way before their times and uh, I knew that if I was next that I was not doing what I love to do and that if I had that moment where my whole life flashed before my eyes I wouldn't go at peace and that freaked me out and so I realized music's really what I wanted to concentrate on I applied to Berkeley I went up there checked out the school and I wore a Berkeley t-shirt underneath all my clothes for about three, four months until I got my acceptance letter. Again, thank you. And uh, I ended up at Berkeley and I did a, finished all three majors or tracks at the music business school there and graduated. Okay. Is it really as hard as everybody seems to think it is? If you're not ready to learn all the math, all the science, behind the music, then it is incredibly, incredibly difficult, basically impossible. Uh, I was 25 and failing classes for the first time in my life. I was 25 and hiring tutors for the first time in my life because you'll hit a ceiling. <laughs> Unless you've got it down, you just can't move forward. Okay. And you broke through that ceiling. I that. did. <laughs> Pain, painfully. There were two classes where I had to take, I failed twice, both of them a piece, and it took me my third try to pass two of these classes. Okay. And now you have a studio. Yes, sir. Tell us about your studio. Well, after I left Boston, I was blessed enough to go to New York and break through the crust of talented and smart but evil people in the industry that are there to take advantage of others hearts and wallets and once I had uh, some years training with gold and platinum award-winning uh, pop producers I hit a point where I knew that if I didn't move out of their shadow quite literally and put together my own sound my own legacy uh, then I wouldn't move forward and my family's here in Birmingham and uh, it's about 600 percent cheaper <laughs> to build property here and I knew that if I was going to have something substantial again where I could produce music that's relevant but also artistically fulfilling worth leaving behind I would need an entire space that was built a certain way thoughtfully uh, to be artistically nurturing, which to me is the most important, but to also produce a relevant product. And Birmingham, just everything was right to come back to Birmingham. Okay. And where do you see the future?
global music industry personally and uh, that's another reason why I came back to my hometown this is Bama gets behind Bama and even if you're a diehard Roll Tide like Bama fan if Auburn makes it to a bowl game chances are you may be at least be rooting for like the Alabama team the home team and uh, those are qualities that not every region has at all and I knew this would be a great place to get started because if I could earn the state support, the people, and what I could do for myself and for the artists here, um, then I've got a shot at the national rankings. And then once you've got a shot at the national rankings, if you can make good on that, then you've got a shot at the global rankings. And that's, that's how I, I see myself moving in a lot of different capacities. It can't just be recording concentrating a lot on bands, on publishing, uh, various parts of the music industry, you know, cell phones in third world countries, uh, developing countries, uh, being able to sell music to those phones is a really big piece of what a lot of people are doing to make money these days. There's a lot of stuff out there, you just really have to go after it, you really have to find out uh, what's hot in certain places and be able to put yourself in a forward thinking mindset so you can see what's next and you have to build you have to architect things towards a singular goal and maybe it'll hit right. and maybe it'll be very gratifying okay and now you want to give us a short tour of your studio if i may i don't know if a short tour is possible <laughs> <laughs> if the way i talk about everything and everything here is so thoughtfully put together it's a uh, all right so every piece in the studio anything you see here exists for a reason and it's only after almost 20 years of being in the music industry as a player as a mixer as a recordist as a producer as a music businessman as a student it's having done everything that I possibly could do in all capacities in the music industry that helped me with the ideas to build this place. The most important thing here is to have an artistically nurturing, focused, calming environment because usually when there's dollars on the clock ticking away, people start to freak out and uh, they don't give their best performances. And you know, there's a lot of amazing engineers, a lot of amazing talent, a lot of amazing facilities, but uh, all I can do or what I do is concentrate on getting the best performances hopefully the performances of a lifetime out of artists here and uh, that makes it ultimately successful that's will that is what will make it a successful place and what will make all of these details and components that have gone into this place worthwhile um, almost everything that we have here as far as gear is all handmade uh, the computer is about the only thing that's not handmade. Uh, pieces that I have that aren't super rare can be commercially available. Uh, I have relationships with their designers and have had them all custom modified to have certain musical characteristics that I really like. Um, we've got LED lighting over here. These are cutting edge LED Gotham, Gotham light fixtures. And the reason why they're so important is because uh, this is not going to be short, man. I don't know how to give you a short one, but uh, they don't emit any heat. They don't emit, emit any uh, noise that the microphones can pick up or distract like a human ear. And they also don't inject any dirty electrical signal into my main electrical path, which is a very important detail for engineers. And at the same time, lighting. Uh, mood lighting is very important for any artist and incandescent bulbs that dim are the dirtiest loudest thing that you can use in a studio and so we're very lucky to be able to purchase these at a time where LED lighting is now consistent across several fixtures from the same manufacturer and same line so uh, we have those capabilities with our lights I've got a calming veil gray color. If you're standing in this mixed position right here, you've got a calming uh, 
veil gray color that neither warms up nor cools down the signal. If you're ever working on a riff on your guitar, on your trumpet, on a vocal riff, and you want to jazz it up a little or take it to the next step, close your eyes, imagine yourself in a gray room, and chances are you'll think of like an extra note or two or to put in or take away, and somehow it may elevate the performance. Our main listening monitors are both encased in custom 320 pound concrete enclosures to basically obliterate any instances of rear reflections and they're both housed on basically foundations that you would find in a home <laughs> or for a home. I had a crane company in Trustville, Alabama build them for me. Um, we've got some of Rupert Neve's newest offerings, got some SSL stuff, got some World War II tube stuff, all original RCA tubes, um, some tube stuff from Australia, some crunchy and airy goodness from Florida. <laughs> um, I also really like the makers of these pre's right here. Got some tape machines for some character when needed. What can I say? We've got a lot of couches for fun. We've got sanctuary blue on all the other walls. Uh, if you're in mixing position in the control room and in the live room, all you will see is this gray color. You will not see blue. Now if you're faced this way, or if you're in the live room, playing, looking out, all you'll see is a blue and the blue here. It just all has to do with keeping a focus and a consistency in the mind of an artist when they're performing in a high pressure situation. Oh. What is super important about the live room here is essentially also what's super important to the studio as a whole. And again, it has to do with capturing mostly an intimacy and a special place and time chemistry between people playing together. Um, it never sat well with me, especially as an artist recording in studios growing up, that bands practice together, they play live together, but then when they go into the studio, they may be in different isolated rooms or like they track one instrument at a time. Never made sense to me. Why change up what you've worked so hard on building the second that you're capturing it uh, like you would do for uh, in a studio? You know, you're, you're essentially capturing it for all time. Why change it up? I never liked that. So we designed a room that it's, it's really it's 14 foot ceilings, 25 by 35 or by 30 foot room, but it sounds like a small cathedral in here when there's none of these sound barriers in here. It's got such a sweet, sweet sound. Uh, it's incredibly articulate and it's incredibly detailed as well. So what we do is we have bands play live in here. Most often we'll do the instruments live and then we'll overdub the vocals later. But we can also do the vocals all at once too. Just normally doesn't happen as much. Um, and essentially there's just this uh, concrete is usually unconventional to use in a studio. But when we closed on this building, it, at one point after demolition, it was a 4,000 square foot shell with uh, concrete floors. And I did this one day. I went, I tapped my foot and I heard this of sound build up and fly down 80 feet of concrete and I was like, wow, we have got to like maintain some sort of that liveness in the live room when it is done being designed and built. And so we've got the concrete floors, got carpets, they all sound great where they are. No joke, you move one, doesn't sound quite as good. You add an extra one, doesn't sound quite as good either. And then we've got the cellulose fiber material on the ceilings which are honestly the baddest material I was able to find on this planet as far as being able to absorb and control sound. I'm, they're on my doors, they're, I've made custom made sound barriers or gobos with them, and all the walls in this studio, in the control room, in the live room, they're all made so there's no parallel walls. So the Standing waves and different like psychoacoustic anomalies are kept to a very bare minimum. Uh, we have a very dedicated two-ton air conditioning system that is just ultra quiet. And so again, we can maintain a comfort level for the musicians while they're recording. 
And uh, behind the walls, there's a whole other separate wall system. This cellulose fiber stuff is actually completely encompassing us right now, but we just can't see it because it's on one of the secondary outer wall systems. And uh, we've got a whole bunch of, essentially, all our mics, all our gear, and the build here. Everything was put together and designed by thoughtful people who really care about the musicality of their product, myself included. Uh, as a proprietor of this place and um, I'm, I'm like not choked up right now but really it just means so much to have a truly musical environment a truly enriching and nurturing atmosphere for artists because uh, it's not easy to find that always and it means a lot to me and um, if any of you watching this ever come in here I believe that your DNA will feel what I'm talking about. And those of you who are watching this that have been in here, I feel confident that your DNA has felt that here. And I uh, feel very blessed to be back in Birmingham with this great project. And I'd like to thank Jerry behind the camera, if that's okay, for his time and for also believing in what I'm doing down here. It means a lot. Thank you so much.